Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another podcast. We want to say thank you again for leaving us reviews. We've seen them on Apple Podcasts. We've seen them on Spotify, on our website. So we really appreciate that. And we love hearing from y'all. So I am really excited. And I know we say that a lot when we start our podcast, but today we have Wendy King on. And I have to say, I went up to Wendy over probably two years ago, wanting her to come on the podcast when we first started. And she is such a busy woman that, you know, we finally have wrangled her in and we're just so excited to share her story. Um, she's extremely impressive, not to mention she's been with Conoco for over 30 years. She was recently promoted to the vice president of Gulf Coast and the Rockies business unit. Um, she has traveled many countries, worked in five different countries. Um, her experience has pushed her to adapt to different cultures and workplace norms. She brings a wealth of knowledge from all around the world. And she's just really an inspiring woman. Um, and she's a mom of two, two kids. So we just love hearing her story and hearing how she got to where she is today. So thank you so much, Wendy, for coming on. Absolutely. I'm thrilled to be here. And uh, I actually want to thank both of you for all you're doing to promote the industry and talk about your journeys yourself. So thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. So let's get straight into it. I don't think a lot of people know that you are originally from a tiny little town in Nebraska. And by tiny, I mean under 300 people. So the fact that you are where you are today, coming from a town from 300 people, just right there says so much about your story. Um, you grew up kind of um, in a farming kind of family. Your dad was in the grain elevator business. He was there until he retired. And um, he always taught you to grab every opportunity that you could and just run with it. He didn't kind of want to keep you in that small town mentality, but it was like the world is your oyster, Wendy, and like go after whatever it is that you want to do. Um, both of your parents didn't go to college, but you wanted to do something different than what your family was and kind of leave a different legacy. And you mentioned that there was a really important um, person growing up who, who was actually one of your teachers who kind of pushed you to go study engineering. And that's maybe one of the reasons why you ended up in engineering and why you have such a successful career, because that's what took you into oil and gas. How, can you talk a little bit about that influence and how important it is to talk to younger women about STEM and that they also have a big opportunity to have a career? Thank you. Now, I know it's great. No, I did. You're right. I did grow up in a small town in Nebraska. In fact, uh, and, and I should collect, correct one thing there. My father hasn't completely retired yet. Oh. So uh, <laughs> how many years? Fact, we, yeah, well, we've been celebrating the other last week. It's been almost 55 years now that he's been with the same company there. Oh my God, that's wow. You know, he's, his work ethic and what he's done for that community has always been an inspiration for me. And um, you, are, you are spot on. I've had support from my family. Even my grandparents supported me getting a good education and encouraged me, um, both parents and grandparents, to, to be all I can be. So I had a great support system there in that small town. And But, you know, your point was what really kind of opened, opened my mind was I knew I was good at math and science. And um, frankly, I know that that's true in our family as a whole, that some people are really inclined to be good at math and science and some people are not. I, that's, that's one of my strengths is I, I enjoyed math and science and the teacher that I had she really encouraged me to consider engineering. And um, at the time I thought to myself, I don't know any engineers. I mean, I'm just thinking a train engineer, right? I'm thinking, <laughs> <laughs> so we driving a train, you know, I wasn't thinking engineering, but she encouraged me to consider the different options. And so it was chemical engineering. She had me look at petroleum engineering, mechanical engineering. And then at the time, you know, she just really encouraged me to start attending engineering camps while I was in high school, start, start to get some exposure to the different types of uh, careers you can have in the different engineering disciplines. And that's what really prompted me that combined with what I thought was a very attractive opportunity from a career perspective to go ahead and apply for degrees. And I actually applied in both chemical and petroleum engineering at different programs when I graduated from high school. So I did feel incredibly fortunate to have had somebody that really kind of opened my mind to the idea. You know, the, the idea that you were teeing up there was how do we encourage you know, more people to go into the STEM subjects? And I really think one of the most critical ways to do that is continuing to try to engage with those teachers that are in those classes. Because it's, you know, they're really on the front line every day of helping to, to educate our children, but also trying to really reinforce what the opportunities might be within those fields. And, and so I think back to how do we as an industry and how do 
how do I, at this stage in my life, continue to support teachers in the math and science fields to, to show what the opportunities are there? And it, it is interesting, once on a plane from um, uh, Anchorage, Alaska to Juneau, Alaska, I sat by a third grade teacher once that commented, well, I don't know if girls should be doing math and science. And I think she was probably grateful to get get me off the plane because an hour later, I don't think I'd show up. <laughs> Just encouraging her to make sure that we don't stereotype that, that people, whether you're a, a young man, young woman, you know, if people are showing inclination to get into math and science, help them see the art of the possible of what those fields can lead to and, and encourage that from a very young age. Um, so much of it can be, do we display excitement when we talk about math and science or do we talk about it in the context of, oh, I have to do my math tonight or I have to do my science tonight. Really talk with enthusiasm, encourage our children. I think it's just something that I, I can't speak highly enough and really want to support our teachers that continue to try to do that and how we as an industry can engage with those teachers. I really like what you said about making it sound fun too. Like you're right. I remember specifically in school, it was always like math was like, oh, like I have to do math homework and that's how it was represented to me. And so that's how I felt about it. And it kind of like scared me. Um, so I really like your viewpoint on like, even as a parent to like promote it and make it sound like, oh, it's fun. You're doing math. It's not like, you know, let's, let's talk about math. Like we talk about how fun it is to draw and do art. And that way it really inspires kids to get into, you know, a STEM type career. But I also think what, what we also see, and I know I felt this too growing up is, you know, it's expensive is, is kind of the realm whenever you think about engineering, engineering school. And you're a great represent, representation of, you know, you grew up with not, there it wasn't a lot of money. So money was tight. Therefore, you know, getting into college, you really had to look at a scholarship. Um, and you actually went to a very prestigious school, I would say, which is Colorado School of Mines for your undergrad in petroleum. And a lot of engineers that I know that come from there, you know, they come out with like a very good wealth of knowledge and it's a really respected school. And on that realm of thinking about money, you know, you also looked at how you can get scholarships in order to help you pay for that kind of education. Um, not to mention that during this time, it was 1985, so there was a big downturn. Um, and when you're being recruited on the campus, you met a faculty member named Ramona. So another person in your life who influenced you, um, you know, you came from a small town and now you're looking at this school here in Colorado and you had a, another teacher that was really an influence. Um, and, you know, recently we've been really seeing how representation matters. So, you know, you saw this woman on campus, you had the lady in high school that kind of talked to you about engineering. You know, can you talk to us about how representation, representation matters in our industry and how it's helped you through your journey and what other women can do to help accomplish, you know, their goals and, you know, who they can look up to, um, to, you know, to still have the same kind of path that you did? Yeah, I appreciate that question because, uh, I would say Dr. Ramona Graves um, from Car School Mine. She ended up becoming the department head um, later on. And in fact, I just had an opportunity to catch up with her virtually the other day again. And Dr. Ramona, everybody calls her Ramona. So if I called her Dr. Graves, she'd make fun of me for going all formal at this stage of the game. Ramona has been um, a, a fantastic advocate for our industry and frankly has been just a, a great champion for, for many men and women to go into our industry. And she, you know, she did, it's important for me to maybe share that story a little bit because I did, I did was, I, I was really committed to trying to go to college, but I knew financially it was going to be a challenge for me. So I was really looking for schools that I could leverage playing sports and the academics that I, I wanted to contribute and be able to try to find my own way to pay for college through a combination of scholarships and working and loans. And, and I was able to do that. And some of those universities, I encourage people to don't let that answer if it's too expensive because there's a lot of opportunity out there for people to, to pursue it. You just you just need to really look hard and work with, with those schools to be able to see what opportunities are out there. But Ramona herself, I, th I think for me, the thing that my mom went with me out to Colorado School of Mines to visit campus and Ramona was wearing Wranglers. She was teaching Mud Lab at the time. She had grown up, I I think in Nebraska, I may be a little bit, but my, my recollection, I remember thinking she grew up in Nebraska, oh, this is destined to be, I'm destined to go work in, and work for her and learn from her while we were at Colorado School of Mines. And she really was a big inspiration for me to, to, um, to go to Colorado School of Mines and then also was a huge inspiration for me to complete it. There were other professors there that also were very, very important in helping me to get through that program because it's not easy. And when you're trying to complete college in four years and play sports, 
it, it does take a lot of support from faculty and from colleagues to get through it, but it was a great experience. Your question though really was around how do you, you around the mentors and, and the importance they played. And you can already see here I am in college now, and I've already had two, two leaders that have been inspiration in opening with the art of the possible might be, and then also reinforcing why Carl School of Mines was a good choice for me. But that didn't just continue there. <clears throat> it stopped there. It continued all the way through my career. And whether they're male or females, having role models that you can look to, uh, to be able to see how do I get through this particular challenge in my life? Like moving to Houston, Texas. I'll be candid with you. I had not lived in the South. I mean, I remember running from one air conditioned place to or another air conditioned place when I moved to June in 1990 to Houston, thinking this is really hot down here. <laughs> you know, am I going to? It just knowing that you've got a support system and role models to look through can help you get through almost every challenge in your life. And what I've learned over time is it's important to have a group of whether you call them mentors or role models or advocates, um, having them from different backgrounds really helps because none of our situations and the paths we walk are exactly the same. And so having a diverse set of people that you're engaging with and talking with about different challenges and opportunities that come up, whether it's in your choices to which degree you take, which college you go to, um, then which choices you make as you're advancing in your career, I, I just encourage people to, to spread the network wide and not be afraid to use that network as you're considering what those opportunities are. And I think it's been, it has been incredibly helpful for me to have some people that have shown me some role models that have shown me um, my first supervisor for Conoco was a woman and uh, Ellen has now formed her own company leading decision decision making improved decision making quality but Ellen was in our industry and raised children and um, helped me to see that I can you know have a dual career situation and I can raise children and I can be the best mom I can be to my parents and still have a meaningful career and having just people like Ellen the Kathy Krychek's of the world that I worked with there's just a number of different uh, people both male and female that have shown to me over the years that there's ways you can do it you just have to figure out what's best for you in your situation mm -hmm. totally agree I think like you mentioned sometimes we don't even know how influential we can be on other people's lives um, that they just, by seeing how you're handling and seeing like, oh, look, Wendy did this, Wendy has kids, Wendy has a successful marriage, like I can too. And sometimes you, like, I, I think we say it almost on every podcast, but representation really does matter. And women need that, especially in this industry, when they look up and see that there are several women in different companies kind of spread around saying like, okay, if they can make it, so can I. And like you mentioned, you kind of have like a board of directors of your life and your decisions where not every mentor is going to help you in all aspects, but you have someone that you go to for career advice. You have someone that you go to for life advice. You have someone that you go to for business advice and just, just in general. So thank you for sharing that. And hopefully with this podcast, everyone has all sorts of, you know, role models that they can look up to through every episode. Um, so let's get back into your career. You graduated, you got a job working for Conoco in their reservoir division. And you mentioned that you were kind of like the odd man out amongst your peers because you were coming in with a new set of eyes. You were more into spreadsheets and softwares and well, you know, more digital. And at that time, the industry was still very big on paper trails and everything was still done, not on a computer. And like anything people don't want to change, right? Because I think we all feel threatened a little bit that our skills are disappearing as, you know, everyone, the industry is evolving and that it's getting more digital. Um, but at that time, you were able to help and show that, hey, we can do all of this a lot more efficient. Can you talk a little bit about kind of how that happened and how you felt when you were kind of coming in and everyone maybe didn't want to necessarily go digital? And then how can the people who are now leaders who are a lot older in the in, in generations in our industry, how they can be a little bit more maybe appreciative of the, the younger people coming in, the Gen Zs, the millennials that are coming and kind of revolutionizing the industry and how that could also be a little bit threatening, but how at the end of the day, it's where the future is and we can use that in the energy transition with all of the young talent. Absolutely. That's a fantastic question. And it, it does date me. So I'm going to confess that uh, it, it's back now to 1990. So if you think about 1990, as you mentioned back in 85, 86, it was a big, pretty big downturn in our industry. So you can imagine graduating in 1990, there wasn't a lot of people coming out of, of into petroleum engineering at that time. We just didn't have a lot of intake in that period. 
but it was the time of Lotus one, two, three. So the very first version of Excel, <laughs> but uh, it, it was a different company. So I'm sure that the people at Microsoft and Lotus would tell me I've got it all wrong, but, but it was the very first version of spreadsheets were coming out. And so I wasn't particularly computer at computer literate per se, but I was definitely capable of running spreadsheets. And, and I was fortunate enough to hire into our reservoir technology group, as you mentioned, which had some of the most amazing subject matter experts on all different kinds of topics, whether it be PVT analysis, DC, DST analysis, um, Eclipse modeling skill. I mean, we just had an amazing amount of expertise in the company at that time, but they were teaching everything based on hard copies, you know, binders that were three inches thick multiple to go on a training course and nothing was digital. And then it, basically what I was able to do is to help those really incredibly smart people by converting a lot of their material into the computer world and having it be in the different suite of products that were coming out over that time. They were able to generate so much more, you know, different um, training tools they could use for the classes they were running. I could also help them with working problems um, much quicker because I could use the computer to do that. And, and frankly, it opened up an opportunity for me as a young engineer to learn from them, but at the same time teach them. And so it created a, a two-way learning opportunity with those subject matter experts. And so my takeaway on this, when I now sit with our young engineers that are coming in from colleges today, and I think about the pure quantity of the data that they're getting. I mean. We were lucky if we could get a bottom hole pressure survey on a well maybe once a year. I mean, I, just getting people to shut in production to get you know some pressure data was like pulling teeth. And so now we have continuous monitoring. So if we, in a lot of our wells, we'll have all kinds of data that we can be accessing. And so the way I look at it and get excited about it for the engineers that are coming in right now is the amount of work they can do and the data they can look through and the kinds of data they can get is so much more powerful. So the engineer of today can do all, you know, they need all the basics we had, but what they can actually do and, and pull from this data is just so fantastic. It's exciting to me mm -hmm. to see what they can. And so I, I don't at all see it as a threat. I see it as a huge opportunity for our engineers. I also see it for our field staffs. You know, I think our, our teams in the field, they, they know those assets incredibly well, the data and that that information that can be provided to them can help every one of them do their jobs better and make them as most efficient as they can. So I think huge opportunity in that space. And I just remind people that it wasn't that long ago, that I guess 30 years is 30 years, right? But it wasn't that long ago, the whole concept of having your own individual laptop where you were doing a lot of your work on that wasn't at all common. It was not common when I started in this industry. And so it's just amazing how much we've been able to do. And I would just encourage to our, our young engineers and our young geoscientists, our young, all of our young petrotechnical staff that are supporting us, that there's a huge opportunity for you out there. Just embrace it and then help learn from those that do have experience and create a two-way share of information. Learn from their experiences and you share your experiences with them. It really is amazing to see where we're at today. I mean, you have everything at your fingertips. It's on your cell phone. I mean, engineers, especially like on drilling and completions. I know there's a lot of platforms where you can literally see, you know, your drilling dynamics and what's going on at lunch. I've seen them check it. And it's really amazing to see where, how far we have come. And in really a short uh, amount of time, if you really think about it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think what's really cool about your story too, is that you are a dual career and not only dual career, but your husband's very successful within Conoco too. And and you just celebrated 27 years of marriage, uh, which is, you know, congratulations. I, we love hearing those kind of stories. Um, and y'all are both really high performers um, and you have two children as well. You know, we really want to ask you like, what is your secret? Because that's a lot of juggling. Um, you know, both of your, you and your husband were in different parts of the world at different times. We know that there was also a period during COVID where you were actually, um, in Houston, and I believe they were in Australia or another country and you weren't able to see them. I mean, there was a lot of balancing that you had to do and a lot of sacrifices you had to make. So couldn't you share with us kind of, you know, if there is, you know, a secret to your relationship as far as, you know, is it communication? Is it just knowing each other's goals? And then also, you know, having that balance of dual career life with motherhood, it, that's always a big, you know, question that people have for us on the podcast. Yeah, that, that's, that is something I do feel incredibly fortunate that I've had the opportunity to, to in our company, because I've had some good leadership that's helped us to be able to navigate what I think is not always an easy situation for all of us. And, and I, I really want to give some credit to some of the leaders that have helped 
me to see through how do we make this work over the years. And so a bit, bit of credit to them, but I'm going to give a lot of credit to first and foremost, my mother-in-law. Um, so I've given her credit and my father-in-law actually as well, because they raised an amazing man that um, I was fortunate enough to fall in love with. And he and I've had a very, very, very uh, exciting journey um, together and both, um, both, I think, feel like we've had it, an amazing ability to live in different places and have a rewarding career. But part of the reason I thank them so much is that they raised a son who didn't just assume that everything would fall on my shoulders. And I think that's incredibly important. And in I'm not going to say for every relationship because every couple of situations is different. The key thing for us was that we knew we needed that balance for the two of us to make it work. It wasn't just assumed if the kids got sick one day that it was Wendy's job to go get the kids from the daycare or whatever situation we were in and, and make it work. It was always a conversation about this has happened. How do we navigate this both as parents and what's the, 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 the most effective way for us to navigate this? It wasn't just assumed it always fell on my shoulders. And in fact, there was a period in Alaska when the kids were quite young, I was traveling a tremendous amount down to Juneau for business. And my husband really stepped up to the plate. And, and I, I tell the story quite frequently. He, he was really quick to tell me, I'm going to do it my way. I don't want you to judge the way I've done it. Just judge whether or not we got it done. Okay. <laughs> so you know, if the kid's hair isn't done the same way that you would have done it, or they didn't eat the same way, just accept that we got through it. And, and frankly, that was some of the patience I had to, to just, you know, make sure I manage, but I also just applaud him for being one to always be willing to step up and not just assume that it always fit into the mother's responsibilities to take care of whatever situations develop. I also encourage people though, I'll confess, we, we, we had, I had two very young, I mean, at the time they were 18 months and six weeks when we found out we were moving to Alaska. A few weeks later, we're moving up to Alaska and getting daycare was very challenging uh, when you've got an infant. I think a lot of people have struggled with, can you get them into a, a daycare and how do you navigate it with two kids? And so we've, we've used a lot of support over the years. You know, I have used nannies. I've used, I actually, in Australia, I think I've told people the story where we job shared um, an after school care provider. So we had multiple college students. We just said, here's the hours we need you to work. Here's a minimum amount um, that you'll be guaranteed. And you pick what works best with your college degree amongst the three or four of you of how you're going to distribute that out. And I find that really interesting because we do that in the oil and gas industry all the time. If you think about the big LNG plant I was responsible for in Australia, we had shifts and you know the superintendent for that shift, he does a handover with the person that's, that's coming in and we make sure we don't drop a beat when you shift out the crew each day. Why do we think that we, have, we can't job share those that support us in our lives too? And so I, I encourage people to think really out of the box for whatever solutions you've got to help with your childcare situation and what works for you personally. Some people don't like the nanny, some people don't work daycare. We did that for a while too where I would do drop-offs and he would do pickups. So one of us could go to work in early and one would pick up later. And if we had to shift, and then the other thing I tell people to build your network, your village, because sometimes something unexpected would come up and you've got to have that phone a friend. I've just had something come up. I really need you to go get my kids. So they're not the kids sitting at the school <laughs> by themselves on the step last minute. And I found everywhere I've lived in the globe, if, some, if you just ask for help and then be willing to return the favor, people will absolutely step up and help you. Mm -hmm. And whether it's women that are in different professions or men in different professions, everybody's willing to kind of help each other, but sometimes we just are too afraid to ask. And uh, I really do think that combination of having a, a husband that supported me and realized that we both wanted to have meaningful careers and then couple that with the fact that I've not been afraid to, to look at creative solutions. And the third thing would be that I've not been afraid to ask for help and then return that favor to others. I think those have all been keys to how we've navigated. I have one, um, my daughter's graduating from college um, next Friday. So it's a little bit of a nostalgic moment for me to, to have her graduate in her degree in mechanical engineering. And I'm just yeah, love it. got a job lined up and, I'm, and my son's a, a sophomore also studying mechanical, mechanical engineering. You know, I kind of feel like, you know, we've, we've been, not only kind of feel, I'm really proud of all they've accomplished, but I'm also really proud of all we've accomplished to get to this place and where I can see them going out to chase their dreams now in the not too distant future. I love that. I think what's been incredible when I first heard your story was that 
in no moment did you or your husband say like, we're going to have to give up on our dreams to make this work. It was always like, there is a dream and no matter, like, don't judge how we're going to do it, but we both have big aspirations. We both want to be career focused and you still went ahead and did it. And I think we asked you um, when we first interviewed you about how did your kids feel about their parents being both high potential, high career, this is big, probably you know, stress of like, they're super successful. We also have to follow under footsteps. And was there any, um, like, you know, people go through the teenage years where the parents are not home or their parents are traveling. Was there ever any sort of like rebellious um, act because they felt like, you know, my parents are too focused on their careers? You know, I, I'm trying to think if there was any rebellious, I, not that I come to mind that they were particularly rebellious on, but I do think it's because we went out of our way to try to be very transparent about what makes us good parents and good people. I, mean, I personally believe you're a good parent if you're proud of where you are in your life and you're making those choices and you've been very transparent. Now, of course, when they're life less than five, that's a very difficult conversation to have, right? Mm -hmm. They're not going to really understand why my mom didn't pick me up at daycare today and everybody else's mom did or why they, that mom was able to bring chocolate chip cookies in and my yeah. mom had to buy bring the bottom ones right <laughs> so those are those are tougher conversations when they're younger and I think sometimes we wear too much of that burden on ourselves that we have to be that super person or super parent that does it all but I think as the kids got older you know I was very and my husband was too we were very committed to having very transparent conversations about the fact that this is something we really want for ourselves. And we think we're better parents because we're pursuing our dreams at the same time we're raising them. And I think, you know, in, in many regards, you know, we have to think about the move from Alaska to Australia, which was a big move for the kids. They were, they were in elementary school at the time, They'd been living in one of the coldest places where you skied and fished and you're moving to Australia, which is one of the hotter places out there. <laughs> and I remember the kids thinking, you know, this, this is going to be really tough. It's going to be a big move. And, um, you know, the, the message I left the kids and, and Warwick and I talked to them about, look at every move, like it's an opportunity to make your new best friend. And if you approach it from that angle of what's positive, what's, what's going to come out of this, that's positive. I think that, and if you walk that talk yourself and your kids see you walk that talk, they'll follow your lead. And I, you know, with, by the time we left Australia, both of our kids had had you know, all of their middle school and um, high schools there. They were thoroughly welcomed into that community there and, and they consider themselves, you know, they do consider Australia home. And I, you know, my daughter's a little bit Alaskan Australia, but my son clearly Australia. And so they, they look at it back now as just a huge opportunity to see different places in the world, get to see different cultures, get to meet new people and, and continue to expand their horizons, which is all I could have asked for them. Now you did tee up, there was probably one of the more challenging decisions that I ever had to make. I mean, we've, we've done periods apart where he and I have made different choices where we've said, we'll take different roles. Like he rotated out of Nigeria when I went in Scotland and we were trying to navigate that. We've also been very transparent that we would live apart for periods of time to accommodate because moving dual career couples isn't always easy, right? You, you mm -hmm. can't just make it happen on day one. So we've been transparent with the company about what timelines we would do that. But that did actually happen in 2019 and that an opportunity presented itself for me to come back to the US, but he needed to stay in Australia and he needed to stay in Australia for the work he was doing at the time. But also our son was about to enter his senior year of high school. And so um, we really, you know, if there was a personal reason, but also a very important professional reason for him to stay. And I remember sitting down with my son, because my daughter was off in college by this point, sitting down with my son and just saying, you know, look, this is really important to me. And, and he, it, it was so interesting. It was the easiest conversation I've ever had with him because he knew this is what his mom wanted. And he knew that he and his dad could navigate me being in a different country. Now, none of us expected COVID to hit you know, six months later, a year later, yeah. and then we wouldn't actually get to see each other for, I mean, it was literally eight months, I think, I didn't even see them, um, other than through FaceTime and wow. Zoom calls like this, um, but I wouldn't change the decision that we made at all. You know, he was, he and I have built a relationship now where he calls me every day because of that time we were apart, maybe not so much now, he's starting to get back to uh, normal, but you know, we built an incredibly close relationship. And I, I firmly just believe being transparent with your kids, having good conversations about where your priorities are, what your commitment to each other is, I think can lead to, and I, 
very successful conversations with them about how, how you navigate those decisions you make. And at the time when they're younger, sometimes you may not feel that way, but as they mature, I think you'll see that that transparency with them pays off. And that's been my experience. I can't say all kids are the same, but that's been my experience. I, I love that you shared that with us. Cause I think that, you know, a lot of people don't understand the challenges that do come with a dual career and also how being transparent can help you through those transitions. Um, but, you know, mentally, and also in your kids understanding, you know, your whole, what your goals are. And I think that's really important to share those with them on a daily basis. It also shows that y'all are very, um, communicative family. So there's, there's probably a lot of stories that y'all tell each other. And I think that's amazing. I love, I love to see families that have that kind of connection. Um, you know, one of our last questions, we have, we have two more left. And one of our last ones is, um, around biases. Um, you know, you mentioned in a quote that we pulled from a featured um, story that we all have biases and most of them are unconscious. We need to create a culture where it's safe to constructively challenge each other and make mistakes. Otherwise, it'll be tough to drive lasting change. Can you share an unconscious bias that you had and how you overcame that? Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I was trying to think through, you know, different ones I've had. I mean, there's the simple ones that you don't even think about, like somebody that went to your same alma mater right? You just immediately, oh, car school minds. I know exactly, you know, and that one I could maybe say was conscious, but sometimes it's unconscious too, or people that maybe you've worked with in the past or um, somebody that, you know, might have, you might have a bias towards one for me is maybe that because I'm an engineer and reservoir engineer by background, that maybe reservoir engineers are more capable to do that. And sometimes you can be cognizant enough to be conscious of it, to think, okay, I might be sliding into a period of bias. The, the one though that I worry the most about right now as a leader though, is that you bias your view of who's gonna get the next, the, the job based on the person that was there before. And you don't even know you're doing it. You've seen somebody that's been incredibly successful or was successful in the role before. And you think to themselves, okay, who do I now, that person's moved on, how do I bring somebody else in? And your vision of what success looks like is based upon what was there before. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're making some changes and not always, but, and so that's where I really try to challenge myself about, am I thinking broadly enough about the suite of candidates that could be coming in for this role that I'm not clouded by either the skills or the experiences of the past person, but what does the person coming in need to actually do the job? And respecting that the person that could be coming in new might actually bring something different and even better to the <laughs> role and not be clouded by that unconscious bias I had of what, what was there before. And so that's probably the one that I'm the most sensitive to right now as a leader and, and really, because the things that are tied to education and you know, where they went to school and stuff like that, I try to be incredibly transparent with my leadership team of call me out if you see me doing that, right? Just mm -hmm. if you see me gravitating that way, but when it comes to that selection for that new person coming in for the role, are we thinking about what's really needed to do the role and what the value of something, of somebody bringing something different into that role might bring or am I being clouded by the past? And that's probably the one that I, I really ask for help. And uh, one of the things that I try to do down in support is that we have, um, at least two people on the interview team to help each other in that space because it's human. We all have biases. Sometimes they're conscious, sometimes they're unconscious, but to have somebody else in the room with you to be able to have that transparent conversation about when you might be sliding into it. And I appreciate the fact that I see our company doing that right now. And in fact, just participated in some interview for an opportunity where I had a, a colleague of mine from Australia that participated with me on that. And that was fantastic because he and I would sit in the same discussion and we both come away from different things. And that, that is just something I think we can continue to do more of as an industry. In fact, all industries can continue to do in our journeys around diversity, equity, and inclusion. I love how you put that. And like you mentioned, I think calling them out is in a, in a nice way and being open to, Hey, if I do this, you know, call me out because you're, you know, that this is something that you have to work on. And like you mentioned, we all have something at some point, whether it's unconscious or conscience. Um, and just to end the episode, um, we had a really important question. You've been with Conoco for over 30 years. You've done tons of different roles. You're kind of, you know, moved up the ladder um, per se was there, how do you handle such a long career within the same company? Was, did you ask for certain roles? Was there ever a time that you got a role that you were like, I absolutely like don't want to take that role, but you still took it. 
Did you at some point feel like for, let's say, X amount of years, your career was stagnant and, you know, there's, there's got to be the ups, the downs, the stagnations in between those 30 years. How did you kind of handle the navigation and did you ask for certain roles because you knew of where you wanted to head or do you think it's luck kind of just worked out and you kind of just let your career flow? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. I do tell some people at times that uh, when they ask that, because there's a bit of a tortoise and a hare story that uh, I, I definitely know being part of a dual career couple, there were times that I'd look across and my peer group was appeared to be moving up much faster, getting different opportunities faster. And let's be honest, moving a dual career is challenging sometimes because you're looking for opportunities for both. And, and both he and I at times would take parallel moves, um, maybe within the same business unit and or um, choices that I would have never expected. And the one, for example, that kind of, I, I kind of point to people that I just never thought when I was in college I'd be doing. When I was up in Alaska, I was working on a big project that was trying, of all things, you're gonna laugh, but we were concerned the lower 48 was running out of natural gas at the time. Prices were pretty high. People were thinking, there may not be enough natural gas. We're going to bring Alaska gas down from the North Slope. And then, of course, unconventionals happen. And you guys, you guys know exactly where we are right now from a U.S. <laughs> perspective. But I went up there to work on Alaska gas. And um, as we were, you know, we were working through that, you know, project. And I, 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 I really thought to myself, oh, goodness, I just lost my train of thought, ladies. I'm just thinking to myself, you know, I thought to myself, you know, there, that then led to a role that I ended up testifying in front of the legislature because I, I was working on this big project and I thought, and I would ended up doing TV interviews and media interviews. I'm thinking, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm an engineer. I don't know how to do all this. And um, it ended up leading to an external affairs job. And I thought, how did I move from being a commercial gas negotiator into <laughs> external affairs and doing things that were completely out of my comfort zone? And it actually ended up being, I learned so much about how our company engages with the community. I learned about the importance of the role we were playing in the philanthropic space, engaging with our local news you know, force. I mean, I, I actually learned a lot of different things in that role, but it was not at all what I expected I'd go in and do next. And, and the team I worked with up there, they taught me so much that I could then take on to other roles and it helped me learn so much about the importance of how our industry engages with the public, engages with our external stakeholders. And as I think about where my future is right now in the energy transition and how I help our industry in this energy transition, those are skills that at the time I didn't appreciate would be valuable to learn, but they proved to be invaluable. And so I, and I reflect upon, did I plan it all out? I planned that I wanted to have a career. I was committed to that career. And where I've encouraged people to have advice, and it's the same thing I encouraged, you know, my husband did the same thing. He moved from a project management role into an individual contributor in finance that led to a whole different learn, learning of skill sets for a while for him. I encourage people to look at opportunities, not necessarily for constantly comparing against your peers, but do they add skills to you that broaden your skill set in a way that you're one, interested in, because you do have to care about it, but two, also, don't narrow you down. You know, they just broaden you in a way that you can actually then be more competitive for more opportunities. And so that's what I just ask people, where in that point do you want to further deepen your skills and one skill set versus where is it important to widen your skills to think about where that future might be? And I also encourage people that it's not a race. It, it, in the end, some of the best experiences I've had have been because I've been in a business unit for a long time. And I got to see the recommendations I've made come to fruition, sometimes good, sometimes they were epic failures. And you learn from both. And that is something I think we all can benefit from as being around long enough to see some of those recommendations come forward. So thank you for letting me share that, that, that perspective of the story. And I, I do think those are things that I encourage when I provide mentorship to others to make sure that when they're looking at two different opportunities, where are you at in your career and what's best for their deepening? or is it further widening and, and don't get too caught up in comparing yourselves to others. Focus on what's best for you and your, your development. And it usually good work, hard work does pay off. So uh, that's, that's what I try to encourage people to do. Thank you so much for that, Wendy. Absolutely. And 
I, I really think, you know, the whole podcast, your advice has been extremely informative. Your story I, is just all inspiring. And every time I listen to you, I just, I'm like, oh, okay. Like I learned so much. And, you know, at the end of the day, we talk about this a lot, but at the end of the day, it's not comparing yourself to others um, because everybody has a different path and we all get there in a different way. And, you know, you started in a small town and look at where you're at today. I mean, you travel the world, you have an impressive career, an amazing husband, two kids, and, you know, you keep moving up in your career after 30 years with Conoco and it's not stopping. So we we're so happy you came on. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you, Michelle. I really appreciate both of you. You've, uh, 